bringing you inside the USL Championship and League One. Segbert's got there for Kalak! He's been knocking on the door! He knocks it down! Diving into all the biggest stories and top headlines. You are ripping and roaring today. This is USL All Access. It's almost impossible to recreate that level of magic. With Mike Watts and Devin Kerr on Sirius XM FC. Welcome, everybody, to a new edition of USL All Access. Happy Tuesday, wherever you might be, and welcome to Match Day 1 of the USL Championship season. Devin Kerr joins me, as always. Emmett McConnell is at the controls. Today, we take a look at the Western Conference. We walk through all the latest on the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup. Also, Devin talks about his dreams, and I talk about waking up on the wrong side of the bed. Uh, Devin, a, a happy Tuesday to you. It's finally time to start the new season, man. We get a chance later in the show to preview week one. How could you not be excited about soccer? How could oh, you not be romantic about it? Gosh, what a world. Although I will say that this this offseason felt, felt shorter, right? Felt shorter? Too short. Too short? You needed more of an offseason? Uh, you and I... The, the soccer season is gradually expanding like the universe. Yes. And I don't know that it's ever going to collapse. To be no, fair, I, I don't know if the universe will either. My goal when I started broadcasting, and this will resonate with you because you've been down a similar journey, although you do more sports, so it's yep. a little different. Mm-hmm. My goal when I started, uh, my first full-time year was 18, and we worked from March until late November. Mm-hmm. the next year so you had four months off and i'm like what am i doing with myself so my goal was to work 12 months man did i get in my own way there <laughs> now i look back and i'm like oh it would be great to have some time off because to your point my last usage was 2024 mls super draft which i believe was december 19th or 20th and basically just got run into the ground for the better portion of three and a half weeks through christmas the new year partially celebrating eight crazy nights with some of my friends that live in the area. Sure. And then you run right into preseason. So I don't feel rested at all. Then again, some of our best work has been when you and I have been you know, pushed down to the mat and had to pull ourselves back up. No kidding. Uh, Dev, for those watching on YouTube, we, we both went with the roots kits. We both know our roots, home and road. I Is it? And I mean this in a nice way. I feel like I'm playing Tetris. On this jersey, <laughs> but it's this is a sick kit. I mean, it, that's a drip kit for I'll sure. I'll give them credit. My question is, what are the numbers going to be? Because if it's standard white, I respect it, and it makes the most sense. It, if they, mm. if they would go with some hieroglyphic rainbow stuff, it's going to be an announcer's nightmare. It will be, yeah. But nothing will ever, ever take the place. Actually, I'd have to. You have to choose one. Would it? Would it be the Celtic kits? From 2018 ICC Futures that the, you and the, I had the to call. The gold and white. Or the San Antonio blackout kits. What black on black. That's black on my, black. Yeah, no no. San Antonio question. 1, Celtic 2, everybody else gets a pass. And if you're an Ottawa Lense fan, and I know this, the, the audience for this is, is odd. Yeah. but I know Black on, on metallic maroon. It's It was not kind to the eyes. <laughs> Again. The playing style was fine. Oscar Sanchez, our boy in CONCACAF, <laughs> loved it. But it, it certainly was not for your viewing pleasure if you were on the comms team. Yeah, kit season is more often than not, I want to buy that kit and I don't want to commentate on it. That's the world we live in. 100%. Unless it's the very plain 2018 Puma World Cup kits. I mean, now we're cooking. Yeah, because that was basically just as vanilla as you could get for everything. Not cake worthy, though. No, no. Wrong kind of vanilla. All right, Dev, let's dig into this. Before we get to a handful of news stories around the league, we'll preview the West. We'll take a look at week one of the season. Let's chat about the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup. Shoot. So where we're at now is that eight teams from Major League Soccer are in. Every team from League One, the championship, are in. Most of the teams... In MLS Next Pro are in. All the USL-related sides in League 2 are in. Then you've got your NPSLs, your UPSLs, your amateur teams. Only one team below Division 1 dropped out. That's that's largely where we stand. We are two weeks away from the beginning of that tournament. That's March 19th. 
Uh, USL League Two is in. All the amateur teams are in. Next Pro teams are in. In total, 64 teams. The first two rounds are going to whittle that down to 16. Round three is where 16 teams out of the championship are going to enter. Then you get to the round of 32. Eight more teams from the championship. Eight teams from MLS. It's been talked about a lot, and it should have been, and it will continue to be. Every scheduled friendly, every conversation is going to lead back to, I thought you were too busy. At the end of the day, the teams that are in are the ones from MLS, not in Champions Cup, and then your next seven down, and the team that that ultimately won it last year, who of course are in Champions Cup in Houston to try and defend their title. That means Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, LAFC, RSL, San Jose, Seattle, Sporting Kansas City. The teams with the most history in the MLS era of this, Kansas City, Seattle for sure, Dallas, but no DC United, no Galaxy, no Fire. In terms of an area that has so desperately been involved in this tournament over the years, no Los Angeles. No St. Louis, no New York from an MLS perspective. um, The Luligans are angry, and I get it. Uh, A lot of my good friends in Cincinnati are angry. Uh, There is no MLS franchise in Cincinnati without that run, most likely. Um, At the end of the day, I, I, I tweeted it, and it's as simple as this. If you're a USL team and you're frustrated by this, Go out and win the damn thing. Yeah. Like that that's where we're at now. There are teams that are only five games away from going to Champions Cup, we think. Presumably. So do you want me to start there or do you want me to start up top and work my way back to that? Go point? for it, buddy. All the right. Let's start roster. up top. Hate to see the fact that this has changed in so dramatically, and certainly in the fashion in which it has. Do I like it? Absolutely not. I don't agree with it. The problem is, is we don't have a say. It doesn't matter what we say or what we do in the world that we live in and the people that are controlling this, we don't have a say. Unfortunately, it's also a lot of walk of life. So the way that I view it is we're still getting a tournament, which is good. Yep. I've become Mike, and I think you can agree with this. I've become my view on the footballing world, and it certainly hits the way that I announce games. I've become much more positive about things. If you think about me in 2018 and 19, I looked at I looked at a lot more negatives and I ripped a lot of people. Not saying they didn't deserve it, because you and I both know they did, including coaches who had conversations with me like, you are brutally honest and you're not wrong. But the way that I ended up flipping it is is because I want to help educate, but also talk about the great things that go into the game, I start positive and then I work back towards the quote unquote negative. So here I think, wow, we have a tournament. That's incredible. We're going to see some teams that certainly have some history. Okay, great. I'm with that. And yeah, it freaking sucks that it's not what it once was. Totally understand that. Because it's a USL-focused show, let's stay there for a second. This will be the easiest, and I use that term very lightly, route for a low-division team to win the entire title, correct? You need eight cup sets over the course of this tournament or watch some MLS teams eventually take each other out later, not 23. Correct. Now, help me out one second with that. So, and I didn't read into the fine print on that. There was very specific verbiage that they were going to make sure that MLS teams didn't play each other unless they absolutely had to. Did the tournament committee divulge how the draw was going to look like going forward? No, they did not. So that scares me a little bit to your point of, well, they could take each other out. That's great. They may do everything humanly possible to make sure that the final eight remaining don't meet till the quarterfinals. Right. So there's that. But you agree that this is this is the most direct path, in theory, for a lower division team to go win it and get into Champions League. That's that's about the only positive as a lower division team you could take out of it. One more question for you, because we heard rumors a couple of years ago. If a USL championship team or a lower division team, let's be very fair to League One and anybody else that is involved in all this, right? If they win it, will they honor the bid? 
They should. Okay. I hope so. Uh huh. I Me hope too. so. Because we heard rumors a couple of years ago when Sack was on that glorious run in 2022 against Orlando City that maybe that might not necessarily go in Sack's favor. Of course, Orlando City had a had a second half that included three goals, and Sack couldn't get out of their own way with their own goals. So, bottom line, we got a tournament. Let's start with that. Um, you and I are going to start our own tournament. Yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, let's do that. Um, <laughs> the 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 Devin Mc, McWatts Cup. Um, coleslaw, coleslaw McRib Cup. Keep going. Yeah. He, he, uh, <laughs> shadow ban. McRib um, Coleslaw. It's a work. We're workshopping it. Yeah. Let, let's say this. For one, all right, you made the rules. You, you want eight teams in if, let's say, Miami doesn't win a trophy this year. An Opa Cup trophy or a trophy? A trophy. Are they Are they going to play in this next year? Oh, that, I see what you're saying. Uh, that, that's all I'm saying. If we're going to say it's the next seven teams in the Supporters' Shield rankings that did not reach Champions Cup. Yeah. Uh, let, let's just all be above board about this. Like, I hope next year everybody's in. But if they're not, let, let's have this. Let's flesh out what this looks like. The other thing I'm going to give credit to U.S. soccer for, and there's a lot of areas where I can take a hack. Yeah. Throw Ultimately, gas on it. Yeah, if if you want to make this compelling for any team in the country to want to play in, raise the raise the stakes, okay? Money. If, if, if that's where we're at, let's let let's have that conversation. I hope Marriott is paying for more than hotel rooms. I hope Mick Lobultra is paying for more than just the celebratory beers. If if you're gonna bring in sponsors, let's do the thing. I can't wait to open up a broadcast in two weeks and say it's presented by whatever one of the four sponsors you have and that you're getting paid for it and that that money makes its way back. As of last year, the winner, and this is pretty, it's been pretty regular over a couple of years, but we don't know what the exact money is this year yet. As of last year, the winner got $300,000. The runner-up got a hundred K and the furthest advancing lower division team got $25,000. Let's be really clear on all fronts. Not just MLS, USL, anything. Even if you start with the top flight teams, $300,000. Half a DeAndre Yedlin. Half a DeAndre Yedlin? Mike, that's that's a charter. Yes. Like, again, depending on where you're going, who you're getting it from, what time you're flying, I get all that, what plane you're on. But, like, anywhere from a hundred to three hundred k you're talking about a private flight. Yep. So this affects everyone. You and I have maintained the entire time. Huff up the money. Yep, I'm talking about U.S. soccer. I'm talking about the pr- the project because that's what it is now. This is a project. No longer is it the prestigious. This is a project cup that we're trying to now figure out how it's going to look like moving forward. I hope everybody can find a common aligning view here because as a fan, as a guy who has played in this tournament, I want it back. And I want it back for everyone. And we need to figure out a way to come to a common ground and do that. And to reiterate, Devin and I both have either called a, a semi or the final since 2019. And Dude, I know I've a been, few tournaments have been out. Right? But you played in it. You and I, 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 yeah, I called like, a cup set for Louisville in 2017 or, or 2018. Um, so you and I have been involved in this tournament from a broadcast perspective for the last half decade and, and genuinely love it. We want to grow it. I, I, I hope everyone comes along with that. Fair. A couple other things to add before we uh, head to our first break here. The West uh, preview is coming up. My well, I got to interrupt you real quick. Is When you said fair, I, I paused. Would it have been wrong if I said corn dog? Or yeah, is that okay. too dad jokey? No, it's that's really dad jokey. Should I have said funnel cake? Better. Okay. Miami FC did announce uh, 12 matches will stay at FIU football stadium. They're moving five to the soccer stadium there. It is grass. It's grass. That is enormous. They've hosted the NCAA tournament. They've hosted uh, the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup games there. Um, They're adding additional seating. They're going to add premium seating. If you're going to be in the same market as Miami, you need to have a unique experience. And a cavernous 30,000-seat stadium wasn't going to do that. Count me as one that says there is additional value to being in a right size venue and creating an atmosphere around it. Absolutely. So, so for the best, it's for the best. 
I would agree with that. And I will tell you this, Kyle Russell, who's the head coach of FIU, my guy, love him to death. They, they take incredible care of that facility. They, they used to have, I don't know if they still have it, but they used to have, when you walked into the, to the stands, down below you, there was this really pretty hedge that sat down in front and almost, it was the, almost the full circumference. It got about 75% around, but it was beautiful because if you're on the opposite side staring at it, it's you can't see the bottom of the th- of the uh, stands. Yeah, and it was just this beautiful bouquet of what I'm gonna guess is some sort of flusia or something like that. But I used to love it. You know, again, I, now I'm really dating myself. I've gone from dad jokes to talking about landscaping. Things are really going well in the Kerr household, as as I can tell. I gotta uh, get out, man. Also, Joey Batista. We we've talked about the the star turn there. He was in the pace car at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway for the Pennzoil 400, also known as the Devon I-9525. <laughs> All right, when we come back, a look at the Western Conference. We're going to go team by team, let you know what you need to know about your squad as we kick off the championship season. <laughs> and Devin will compose himself again when we get back on USL All Access. Let's get back to USL All Access on Sirius XM FC with Mike Watts and Devin Kerr. Welcome back to USL All Access. If you miss any part of the show, available on the USL YouTube page, also available on the Sirius XM app. With Devin, it's Mike. Uh, let's take a look at the Western Conference. We previewed the East last week and the aforementioned ways of, of, of watching or listening again. Uh, you, you can go ahead and take a, a quick gander at that. All the while, let, let's get into the West. Now, two teams entered the Eastern Conference, Rhode Island, North Carolina. It means two teams have to go West. Uh, ultimately, that means Memphis and Tulsa are now Western Conference teams with San Diego and RGV having dropped out. As we mentioned the last two weeks, just to clarify, you'll play every team in your conference home and home. There's your first 22 games. Then you'll play six home, six away against the teams from the opposite conference. And now you're at a full season. The playoffs will kick off in the Western Conference November 1st to the 3rd. Then you'll end up seeing the the final noon Eastern CBS uh, Saturday, November the 23rd. All right, Dev, we're going in alphabetical order. We're going to start with Colorado Springs. Last year, they looked like the best team. They looked like the worst team. It all happened within like a a two-month stretch. They (laughs) lost to San Antonio in the playoffs, got a tough draw. San Antonio dropped to fourth. Colorado Springs finished fifth. Three games above 500. Out Chapman, Romario Williams, Duchesne Beckford. Uh, Drew Scundridge goes east. And now he's in the same city as his wife. Finally, Oscar Agron out as well, the center back. I was intrigued by what they brought in. A lot of guys from same. RGV, from Loudon, Aiden Roach, Akoa Santos, uh, Wahab Akwe. I'm interested to see Ronaldo Damas in. Yep. Uh, In that group. Zach Zandi comes off injury. Uh, Hopefully there's something left in the tank for him on the field. Dev, they also made a change in coach. Chambo, James Chambers is in. Uh, They end up moving Stevie Hogan up to the top of the organization. What do you make? I like the rookie, by the way, too, that you didn't mention in Quincy Armand, the kid from North Carolina. Uh, No fear type player in the final third that you can play in the nine, but primarily going to be utilized on the flanks. And in that type of system, whether they go wing back or play the wide high four, two, three, one, it's an interesting one with all of those guys, a ton of attacking power. Once again, James chambers is awesome. He is an incredible person, a beautiful (laughs) footballing mind. And we talked about the separation of church and state earlier on this year with Chambo and Hoagie going either direction to eliminate kind of the override at times that that each of those people ran into because they worked so hard on the coaching side and then Hoagie was kind of left out to dry. Not his fault, but because he had to do so much on his own. Brendan Burke had the same position. Well, now the club has given them the opportunity to separate that. That makes it easier in theory. I still see this as a wide open team that can produce goals whenever they want. Would love to see some consistency on the defensive front. Let's chat about El Paso. Now, they finished seventh. Again, there were moments where they looked really, really good. They were the only team that reached the playoffs in the West with a negative goal difference. They finished minus 10. It's their second year with Brian Clairhout. All the guys that that you go, that's El Paso, or most of them are gone. Josue uh, Aaron Gomez is out. Chapa Herrera has been there from the beginning. 
a Castician came in the last couple of years is out. Eric McHugh, Mark Navarro, Luis Solignac went to San Antonio. Uh, they picked off a couple guys from throughout the West primarily. Uh, Moshe Bon and Martin from San Diego, Dylan from San Antonio, Moreno uh, from New Mexico. They go out and get Akin Yodi and Rivas from Miami. Tony Alfaro has been around the league. Lucas Stoffer. A lot of people are excited about Brandon Craig. Year two under Brian Clare, how it looks like what? Got better, got more consistent in terms of the profile of player, and you got more experience behind your belt. I would say that there were two teams that I was disappointed with in 2023. El Paso Locomotive was one of them. The second one you couldn't control. It was New Mexico United and Eric McHugh. I've talked about my my respect for what he was able to do in 2023 and how that's going to funnel over. They just didn't have an long enough runway. With El Paso Locomotive and adding those players, to me, knowing what those guys are capable of, if you get them all headed in the right direction, this should be a very active, free-flowing, but also condensed system that allows this team to most certainly be one of the top six in the West. I didn't say top four because El Paso Locomotive and what they've done away from home has never really translated historically to a good balance, both home and away record-wise. So that still scares me when they go on the road. Remember, Mark Lowry made that thing a fortress. They need to get back to being unbeatable at home, but still finding a way to get points on the road because they've struggled the past couple of years. Yep, so El Paso will try and improve on their seventh-place finish. El uh, Las Vegas. El Las Vegas. Uh, yeah, it, it just, I was going to call <laughs> I was it El. Bautista changed the name, too. <laughs> I, I was going to say it, El Reboot, Viva Reboot. It is a complete <laughs> gut job. They completely restarted this thing. Uh, and for good reason. They finished yeah. on 19 points. They lost 21 games last year. So, look, you bring in Dennis Sanchez. He was at Austin, too. Charleston assistant, Sacramento Academy director. Uh, Jose Bautista buys the team. Pretty much everybody's out. They haven't really filled the roster out in its entirety yet, but look but, at some of the vets they got. Yeah. Fabian Garcia's in. Solomon Asante, if there's anything left. Uh, Charlie Adams. Uh, Gasu Samake from Loudon is an interesting prospect that hasn't entirely hit yet. I'm also super intrigued by Edison as Kona because I watched him with the Dominican under-20 team that qualified for the Olympics. One, that means he's going to miss some time. Because yep. he's going to the Olympics. Second, this kid's really talented. Never really got the full opportunity with Miami, did he? Well, and, and, and look, their goals changed overnight. <laughs> for sure. But but also, and I'm with you, but the other problem is, is there were so many young players, remove the positional aptitude of what they brought to the table, the youth that progressed so rapidly, right, within Inter-Miami, didn't allow Edison Escona forget to get on the field to have a roster spot. Right. So kind of bounced around. I agree with you. I think he's extremely talented. Moving forward, this team added a ton. Like creative, absolutely, with Solo and um, and Edison Escona, Samake that can stretch the field. But they did sprinkle a little bit of defensive help. Um, Charlie Adams in the midfield still remains to this day one of my favorite central players in the entire USL championship. The guy sees, can do everything. Um was a massive, massive asset to what San Diego Loyal brought to the table in their playing style. And so it's going to give them the luxury. I'm with you, though. You you can't really express a full opinion because they don't have a full roster. And, so and they'll announce it this week. Of course. You, 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 le you legally have way. to. <laughs> right. But, yeah, the, the Llamas, by the way, are they back? I haven't seen one press release about these Llamas. One. Well, the one dotty, right, past? Yeah. Dottie oh. passed two years ago, I believe. Might I have didn't been Dolly. Realize that. Yeah, it was either I think it was Dolly or Dottie. Of course it was one of them because there's only two. I think it was Dottie, though, which is really sad. But the other has remained. I'm here for the Lama staying. Get rid of the jokes, get rid of the kiddie pools, keep the cash drop at halftime, invite no one but Mike for us to chase the money, add some players to the roster, and there's your recipe for success. You know, this multi year deal we signed actually includes a cash drop in it. Who would have thunk? Yeah, who uh, knew? But it's all all one dollar bills. All right, Dev. Uh, Memphis moves to the West last year, second in the Eastern Conference. A lot of people thought they were left for dead. Here's where things get really interesting. Stephen Glass came in four straight playoff appearances, back to back number two seeds in the East. They are now four hundred and two miles 
east of their nearest opponent. That's Gross. Tulsa. Gross. So that's rough. You talk about outgoing. If you were an all-league player in Memphis in the last few years, you are no longer in Memphis. Those were Ben's guys, and Ben went and got a bunch of them. Now, they went out and got guys like Oscar Jimenez, Vet, Tyler Derrick, goalkeeper, Nico Brett, all-league, Tulu, um, you know, A.B. Sissoko, uh, Noe Mesa. Got a little bit of everything. Marlon Santos. It's it's a little scattershot, and yet I'm not betting against Steven Glass yet. Like, he knows what he's doing. I would agree. That that team started strong, and they just kind of held on for the rest of the year, right? Felt that way. Felt that way. And after, I'd say, like, week 12 or week 14, somewhere in that area, it felt just like games where they hung around as opposed to actually being the aggressor. Don't necessarily think that the players they added are going to allow them to do that. I, I want to tip my hat here because we had the opportunity to join some of the guys down in Louisville. And I said this on their pod, and it's deserved to be said here. Is there anyone that you're more excited about getting a continued opportunity in the USL championship besides Oscar Jimenez? A guy that was basically left for dead at Lou City two years ago, who we discussed thoroughly. We brought it up on air. Coming into 2022, I approached it with Danny Cruz and said, is he probably the one that's going to be on the out here? And Danny said, yeah, it's going to be hard for him to get time. He didn't get a lot of time and yet almost irreplaceable. That's a big asset that can play anywhere on the back line for you and will give you quality, consistent minutes. He's shown that over his career. There was a blip about three and a half years back, but he seems to be back on track. I don't know what this team is going to be. They still have the makings of a playoff team. This is the most dense year the USL championship has ever had because of their growth. So it's going to, for me, this is a team that hovers. They're like six to 10 Mm. right in that window. Uh, Monterey Bay finished 11th last year, finished 04 and one. If they had any results at the end, they could have been in. The team is basically intact. Now, Gleedle's out. Ocoli and Valeski never really hit it. You lost your captain, Hugh Roberts. James Murphy was key in their midfield. Tristan Traeger is interesting. Luther Archimed is the forward that I think that Frank Yollop has always wanted in this system. Uh, Carlos Guzman from San Diego, major Mexican experience. Xavi Nalati, young player from San Diego coming in. It, it, basically, it feels like they're going to try this again with a little more speed. I'd say this team is exactly where Memphis is going to be. Mm. Respectfully. Yeah. I, I have a lot of respect for Frank Yollop. Like, when I look at the... When I look at the roster, correct me if I'm wrong here, Mike, you look at a lot of guys that can do their job-ish, right? Like, they're guys that are going to give you minutes. They're guys that are going to score goals. You know, They belong in the league. Be, they belong like, in the league. All, like, but nobody's head turners. Nobody's going to put this team on the back as of right now. Yep. Right? And and to me, the biggest loss is James Murphy. I know Sam Gleedle is going to be great for Louisville in theory. I, I respect the move. But James Murphy and what he did for that team in the midfield, playing deep, popping into pockets, moving this team forward, he was he was very spoken on the field. He was certainly outspoken in the best of ways off the field. You lose that experience, you lose leadership, and you gain players that are going to help you. I don't see anybody that it's going to put this team into the stratosphere, which is why I say they hover right at that 6-10 to 10 mark again. All right, uh, last one of, of this segment, New Mexico finished eighth. They got in out against uh, Sacramento in the Western playoffs, uh, finished below 500. First full year for Eric Quill, which means the first year of something new out there. Uh, a lot of guys remain. Tim Bacchus and Seymour and Nava and Ryden, Rivas, uh, Hernandez, Hurst, Bruce Swartz. Those are all New Mexico guys. But Josh Suggs is out. Santi Moar is out. Chris Weehan re-injured his knee. Who knows what's next for him, if anything, at this stage of his career. Sam Hamilton, Amando Moreno is out. Hosu Flanagan, uh, Chris Gloucester's been a big name historically that just hasn't had his run yet. Uh, Dayon Harris, Abu Dunlady is a former number one super draft pick. Marco Micheletto is really interesting. A next pro cup MVP. Yep. Uh, Dev, like here's the new look, New Mexico United. Here they go are. Fi- go figure out how to win at home. First off, that would be a start. I just, I, I, that's one of the things that perturbed me the most about Somos Unidos is this is a team that lost four home games in three years. Now, I understand in 2020 for COVID, they didn't have a single home game. Fine. 
argue four games in two years. Like that's what we're talking about here. The lab was, was such an incredible atmosphere that crumbled opponents before they even stepped in. Eric Quill needs to find a way to harness that power. Once again, as far as the roster, I like the roster. I look at this team as they continue to gel and certainly under his playing style, I could see this team pushing into a home playoff spot. The problem could be here is if things don't go well right away and he doesn't get some of this youth or guys that don't have a ton of experience in the league, if he doesn't get them all on the same page, they could dig themselves a deficit that might be impossible to replace because of the Western Conference. We think the West is better than the East this year? Yes or no? More depth. Yes. That's what I mean, right? Yeah. It, it's more it, in terms of depth, like the teams are better. So I would hate to see them fall behind early and then not be able to play catch up with everyone. I do believe in in this team, Eric Quill, very, very particular about the fact that this team is going to play advanced football. He wants them forward facing. We saw a lot of it last year, given the offseason, the players they brought in an actual preseason with this team. I have high hopes for the squad. All right. When we come back, a look at the rest of the Western Conference and we hit the mailbag, which it's 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 empty all right it's coming up oh wow it's coming up next on usl all access giving insight to all the biggest moments in championship and league one this is usl all access on sirius xm fc with mike watts and devin kerr welcome back into usl all access miss a part of the show the sirius xm app or usl youtube channel is your friend emmett put it together devin uh, gave the content. Uh, I- I'm just sort of here, you know, sending him in different directions. Uh, we're previewing the Western Conference. We're in the back half of the alphabetical order. And thankfully, we're wearing our Oakland kits today uh, to successfully chat about the roots. They finished 10th. Last year, Noah Delgado said, look, if we make the playoffs, we can do some real damage. But they didn't. It's the second year with him. Some guys that come in. Justin, uh, Justin Rasmussen comes in from Portland, has gotten some time there. Michi Nader Cherry is interesting from Haiti. I've watched him a lot in CONCACAF. That kid's a stud. Um, whether or not translates, I don't know. Niall Logue, uh, Camden Riley are in. Nane, Palais, Clementa, Morad, uh, Barbier. A lot of defenders out from this Oakland team, Dev. I don't know what this Oakland team is. For a team that for the past couple of years have kind of been certainly, certainly under Juan Guerra and then the continuation of Noah, who had a good nucleus of players. Mm -hmm. It was a team that had intensity. It was a team that certainly in 2022 could pretty much score at will down the stretch, um, at least halfway through the season until until Juan left for Phoenix. Then defensively, always stout. I don't know what their identity is anymore because you hit it. They lost so much on, on the negative front to try and push off these attacking moves, right, from teams. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's still enough talent there that can help you. I, Even though I'm wearing their jersey right now, I fear for them. I fear for them in general. I certainly fear for them in the Western Conference. He, ne- he needs help, and they need an identity. They need an identity that can't just be culture-driven right now because they lost a ton of talent. Yep. Uh, also on the women's side, go Soul. Big fan. Go Jess Clinton. Go. Uh, that's the W League, uh, and then uh, hopefully Super League sooner than later. Orange County finished third. They finished on fire, won a playoff game, lost to Phoenix. That was arguably the the two hottest teams at that point in time. Oliver Weiss just went to USLHQ, so you lost the the puppet master on top. You've kept your coach for year two. Uh, Milan Olaski is finally gone. 38 goals the last two years. Mark McNulty never really hit. Culture pieces, Alex Villanueva, uh, Brent Richards. You go out and you get guys like Charlie Asensio. Um, Jafal from D.C. United never really got his shot um, at, at real time there. Christian Sorto from Miami. Uh, article just came out about Ethan Zubak going back to Southern California. Duran Faree, if he gets time, that's great, but I'm not counting on him in goal. Um, but most of the team stayed together. We lost a ton of goals. <laughs> uh, a ton of goals, right. You lost a ton of goals, which is going to be a problem. Uh, let's talk about Jafal. Like the addition of Sophie and Jafal, this kid, again, I'm, I'm talking about some of the young ones because these teams have done such a good job of maintaining most of their roster. Uh, six, eight-ish in the midfield. Don't necessarily think they needed him, to be honest. 
But, okay, fine. The Orange County should be a good team. I don't see them finishing as high as third because I don't know where the goals are going to come from, Mike. We said this two years ago, and they found Milan Olaski. I'm That's looking great. at this well, that... right now, and and that was a pipe dream. Okay, and yes, it was. Maybe maybe to the level that he brought. You knew that kid was going to get you goals. Super Let's talented, but yeah. 40 goals in two years, no one saw that coming. No, that's a 10. I, like, if I had to bet on him, that was 10, 12, maybe 15 tops. I wouldn't have gone that high. Right. All due respect to Ethan Zubak. I get it. He was with Los Dos back then. Nashville bounced around. Okay, fine. I don't see him pushing the envelope either. I hope he proves us wrong. I hope he is the guy and the guy scores 15 or 20 goals. I just don't see it right now. The main concern for me is going to be what they do in the final third. Everything yep. else behind them seems fine to be structurally sound and stay in games, but that is going to be the catalyst for their success. Without 15 goals from Ethan Zubak, if they don't bring anybody in, do they get a home playoff game? They don't make the playoffs. Okay. Uh, all right, Dev, Phoenix Rising. Uh, finish sixth. Lowest seed to ever win the title. Defeat Charleston in penalties. Juan Guerra becomes the assistant in Houston, took Brendan Burke's gig. Burke goes to, to Hartford. Danny Stone's been around the last three years, but now he's the head man. Darnell King retires. Artiaga scored so many big goals last year, goes to the Rowdies. Trejo goes overseas to Europe to Poland. Uh, Carlos Harvey goes to Minnesota. Daniel Crutzen uh, retired. His knee was giving him problems. Juan Carlos Asakar, I guess. Remy Cabral could be interesting. Uh, Certainly, um, Skiersy from um, Omaha, Omaha, twice all league. Uh, Rito, I love, love, love. Uh, obviously, Lawrence White, there's a lot to be said about that, that that's better served at another time or on the field at this particular juncture. Uh, can Phoenix repeat with this group? Oh, I paused. Yeah, there's the there's a long pause there for a reason. Um, I don't Pan know. Can and they... Will are different, right? They can, can and will. Can they? Yes. Will they? I don't think so. Um, I, I will say this, though. To me, the team got better on the outside. Uh, all due respect to Darnell King, it was time. The guy put in shift after shift after shift, year after year, at multiple organizations, but certainly has been an absolute steward for Phoenix Rising. But with Rito and Darnell King, it makes you more dynamic on the outside. Carlos Harvey is a huge loss in the midfield. That guy is an absolute dump truck, so replacing him is going to be difficult. The idea here for them is that Remy Cabral is going to burden that load. And I think Kevin Cabral has probably given him a, a bad name because he couldn't hit sand if he fell off a camel, couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat. You like those analogies? That's perfect, Dev. How do you like great. them apples? How do you like them apples? I, Listen, I got her number. So it's kind of a similar argument for Phoenix going forward because you lost so much, right, with Ardiaga and Trejo. The th interesting thing to me, though, Mike, is I'm less concerned about Phoenix in the final third as I am about Orange County because so much of Orange County's success was predicated on one person. So much of Phoenix Rising's success is predicated on the entire system and every player and how they put the ball on the deck, how they spread it wide. It's underlaps, it's overlaps. I'd actually make the argument, people are going to think I'm crazy, that the loss of Carlos Harvey is bigger than either Trejo or Arteaga. Individually, yes. Individually, absolutely. Now, yeah, like, okay, I get it. You've gotten, whatever, 7 of the 11 or 9 of the 11 if you go back to the final and if we're talking about starters. But friendly reminder, Arteaga did not start in that final, and there was a reason for that. They had moved on from what was his profile. Danny Trejo, yes, huge loss. But I do see Cabral being able to fulfill some of that up top. I don't necessarily know if they're going to need one striker. Because even if you look at Phoenix historically, I get it. The goals and everything. But they've always had three guys, right? They've been lights out in yeah. the final third. So that's what I see. I, I'm less concerned with them. Uh, home playoff squad. Top four. Uh, Dev, yep, they'll be desert dreaming throughout the year. All right, uh, Sacramento, basically th this team is last year's and the year before that's team. Yep. Kako's a big loss, make no mistake. Zico Lewis never fit when Mark Briggs got there. It just has not worked. They they part ways. Luther Arshamed, talented profile, again, didn't work. Um, You go out and get the Golden Boot winner from League One. You get Jonathan Ricketts from RGV. 
This is a team that won the West in the in the in the regular year and then fell out to Phoenix. So give it another go. Yeah. Top four team, right? Um last year the departure of Sacramento Republic from the Open Cup really saw them hone in on league play. And we didn't see that in 2022. 2022, they kind of brought up the rear and squeaked their way into one of those superior positions, right? So now all of a sudden you're looking at them. What exactly are they going to be? Well, they're going to be a really good team once again that is very difficult to break down. Didn't at one point in time they had eight shutouts for the first 11 games or something stupid like that? I mean, they were... But in in the Open Cup, they were giving up like five or six goals. Yeah, Exactly. They were impenetrable. (laughs) So I see a very similar team that for Sacramento Republic is just looking for goals. They want Trevor Mond to be able to get in there and finish things off. Could be... I'm never going to go against Mark Briggs. To me, he's one of the more astute minds that we have in the championship. All right, last two here. San Antonio, ton of changes. Jordan Farr is gone. The mentality monster. Uh, Garcia, you got a handful of guys. Oluwase, Zuhir, on loan that are gone. Bailoni was hit and missed. Connor Maloney, critical to that back line. Ja'Cory Hayes played a lot. Justin Dillon, in and out as the striker. Christian Pirano is gone. P.C., if he ever played, I think we knew what he was capable of. A ton of injuries. Uh, Hanson, Asakar, all gone. You go out and get Kevon Lambert, all-league guy. Solignac, all-league guy. Agadello, I don't know that he fits that system at all. Kendall Burks, uh, former first-round pick, Chicago. Uh, Paulo Cisniega comes in from, from LAFC, was in Charlotte. There's your goalkeeper. The funny thing about San Antonio is they're owned by the Spurs. They should have money by the buckets, but they don't. That's not the way they operate. And they got picked apart and went out and bought three or four big time pieces. And I'm interested to see what they look like when you bring in the big names and put them in this system instead of making big names out of the system. No question whatsoever, they got a good goalkeeper in Pablo Cisniega. That guy can perform at a high level, but I'm with you. I'm concerned for this team at this point in time. Give it three months. Exactly. That's the biggest thing you take away from San Antonio is Alan Marcina set the identity for them a long time ago, right? They are going to beat you into submission, and then when they are struggling for a performance, they're going to find a way to have a special moment. I could see that happening once again for San Antonio FC. The difference for them is going to be now Who are those people going to be? Because we don't know. I I have a problem with everybody that they lost, Mike. Because in years past, the players that were gone were usually guys that weren't Alan Marcina's guys. I mean that respectfully. I mean in the sense of they were loanies. They were one-year guys. It wasn't your all-league goalkeeper, goalkeeper of the year. It wasn't a defender that could have had an argument for defender of the year in Garcia. It wasn't Connor Maloney. It wasn't Justin Dillon, Christian Prano. I know it didn't go well second time around. Right. But like he was one of the guys, you knew his talent. He was. Yeah. And so you've lost so much. And at this point in time, although big names, I like Lucho Solignac in the pickup. I think he'll fit right into that system. Um, I don't know where Agadello goes. I agree with you. Lambert will be a mentality monster for sure. Kendall Burks is good with either feet, quality outside back that can play at center, or quality center back that can play at the outside back position, that little three, four pivot that they like to do at times. But they lost so much. As we're talking right now, I'm concerned for this squad and exactly where they're going to finish. They ain't a top four team right now, Mike. Doesn't look like it. All right, last one FC Tulsa finished 10th in the East. New president, new head coach. Amario Sanchez comes in. Luke Spencer comes in as the assistant to him. They went off five game win streak last year. Everyone went, oh, wow. All right. Maybe Tulsa's got it. It was Detroit, Indy, Miami, Hartford, RGV. None of them made the playoffs. There's 15 of your 39 points in a five game span against nobody. Bunch of big names go. Apps, Bird, Malou, uh, McCabe, Fernandez. You go out and you get in some league names. Alexi Sawahi had been in League One the last few years, but was at Louisville. Justin Portillo uh, was part of that great uh, Real Monarchs team. From Venezia, you get Harvey St. Clair. Then you go to the league. One guy's uh, Arthur Rogers, twice defensive player of the year, and the next pro guys, Diogo Pacheco uh, and Stefan Stojanovic. I I don't know yet. We don't know anything about this team yet. Nothing. 
I'm going to be even more concise than that. I'm not going to pass judgment on Mario Sanchez or Luke Spencer. No Luke better than Mario. Have a lot of respect for both of them for sure. I have no clue what this team is going to be. It's yep. that simple. Like, it's that simple. And then I'm not willing to say, I don't like this. I don't like that. We do not know. I wasn't more concise, and we are going to break. All right. When we come back, we'll preview week one, tell you where you can watch it, and mailbag, first time of the year. It's next on All Access. You're listening to USL All Access on Sirius XM FC. Here are your hosts, Mike Watts and Devin Kerr. Welcome back to USL All Access here on Sirius XM FC. Opening weekend of the season, opening game of the season is on XM FC. New Mexico, Pittsburgh, 4 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock Pacific. Uh, That's Saturday, and you'll hear it right here on the channel. It's also the first weekend with CBS Sports and Golazo Network picking up games. Now, for I got to ask this question. For Golazo games, if you have a local TV deal, you're still going to be on TV, but you're not going to be on ESPN+. Plus. So you can go to Pluto TV, the CBS Sports app. There's a bunch of ways to watch. Um, It's uh, North Carolina, Charleston at 7 on Saturday on Golazo. Sacramento, Orange County is a huge game, 10 p.m. on Saturday night. It's the same way you're going to watch Serie A. Think of it that way. Inter, Napoli, Genoa, Juve, Fiorentina, Roma, they all play on Golazo this week. Go ahead and take a look. Uh, Dev, you're on Golazo too. Friday will be the first of many, many, many opportunities for the USL Championship to give a preview on Golazo. So I'm going to be joining that crew. I don't know who I'm going to get yet, and I don't know what time is the problem, only because... They had some things they wanted to move around to give us more time. It is going to be Friday evening, somewhere between 4 and 7 p.m. Eastern time. I will be on the road. I will be in Orlando. I don't know what my backdrop will be like. I probably won't be wearing a headset, but we will be talking footy on Friday. I got to figure out what I'm going to wear. Supposedly, they want me to show up in a kit, Mm. but I already wore this one. What else did we wear earlier? Rhode Island? Yeah, we did. I need a new kit. Anybody got three days to send me something overnight? Ship it. Lo- love to see it. All right, Dev, there are nine games this weekend. A couple others of note. Uh, Memphis and Vegas kick off the season same time, 4 p.m. Eastern time Saturday. Uh, reigning champ debuts, Phoenix against Birmingham, Oakland, and, and a new look Indy. Sacramento, Orange County are probably the big games there. Anything to add, or do we talk about your dreams? No, I want to add one thing. Uh, I'm actually – wait. You can add first. Do you have a game you're most excited about? Sack Orange County. That's your game? Love it. You know what game I'm most excited about? Bet you, you I don't think you'll guess. I mean, we only have three minutes left. Oakland and Indy. Ah. I'm excited most about it because as we talked, Oakland, they've lost so much. I don't know what their identity is. And an Indy team that right out of the gate has to go cross country and try and figure out a way to take on the Oakland Roots, Indy with their star-studded roster, Sean McCauley, like, they got to get it right quick. Yep. Uh, all right, Dev, uh, real quick, good reading on the USL website. Want to mention this. Nick Murray got uh, Chambo, oh. Pierman, Danny Cruz, and Bl- Brian Clairhout all in one Zoom room together. That is awesome. Uh, go take a look at that. That's something I- I'm looking forward to reading uh, today as well. All right, Dev, uh, what what do you make? Uh, me, 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 how do you say it? Mailbag. Mailbag. I've, I've been working on my vocal tunes in the offseason. Can you tell? No. Okay. The mailbag is actually courtesy of, I had a couple DM to me. I have to take the one that was put out right there in the open from our one and only Emma McConnell. Wow. Emma McConnell writes at EMC Connell, two N's, two L's, 92. Which team should I support now that Eric Quinalda has barred me from being a Las Vegas Lights fan? It was too incredible to pass up. Michael, <laughs> the floor is yours. Uh, if you like your scrappy do-gooders, let's go Oakland. You're going with Oakland? Does he have to stay in the West or can he change? No, conferences? he can go anywhere. It's his world. Okay. You know who I'm giving him? Yeah. Because I want them to be bad. I mean, I want them to be good so bad. (laughs) I want them to be good so bad. I think we should give them Loudon. Ryan Martin's Martin's a great guy. They're young. They're talented. They've got charisma. Like, they've got a little bit of everything about them. He just needs some depth on that team. Dev, you got another quickie? 
Yeah, I'm curious why we don't give Emin a title contender. No. <laughs> he just went from Vegas to Loudon. Get ready to suffer, my man. I'm from Cleveland. Deal with it. I do have another quickie. Somebody asked, hang on. <laughs> What's your favorite new kit this year? Oh, that's uh, a hard one. The Charleston uh, black the away. Gold and reds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty nice. The stitching, the little. The, the um, red. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if I have one. I'm not politicking, by the way, because I think there's so many good kits that have come out this year. I'm the first one yeah. to throw someone under a bus and light a fire, but I actually think they did a really, really good job with a lot of kits this year. Yeah. The Charlie kits are interesting. I, I'm a big fan. Like, yeah. yeah, they got this right. They really did. I, Charlie. No, yeah. Dad uh, joke number three. Yeah. Dev, you learned anything this week? I learned that it is possible to put me in a position of power and still probably steer someone in the wrong direction, i.e., Emin and Loudon. Uh, I learned that Devin sent me a text this morning at 7 a.m. saying, I had a very vivid dream and I want to talk about it. And it's the only dream we didn't talk about in this show. We talked about literally all the other dreams. We talked about everybody else's nightmares. Sure did. All right. uh, For Devin, Emmett, Mike, enjoy the first weekend of games, everyone. And we'll talk to you again next Tuesday night here on USL All Access. This is USL All Access. If you missed any portion of the program, listen back anytime on the SXM app.